morning, dear friends. It is a pleasure for me to participate, at least virtually, and in spirit through this video, in the inauguration of this important event as part of the government of Ecuador, I am convinced that cooperation between public and private sectors is fundamental to advance social goals and this initiative is one fine example of that. I am pleased to witness the collaboration between Amshan Guayaquil and the Houston Mayor's Office of International Trade and International Affairs with the support of private organizations like Lady Tan Space and the Guayaquil Space Society. In this innovative endeavor, it is difficult to visualize the whole number of opportunities that will be open from this collaboration between the city of Houston and Ecuador. The historical ties between Guayaquil and Houston provide a model for other cities in Ecuador to promote trade and cultural and import as an important component of our country's bilateral relations. The city of Houston has been successful in promoting industry diversity and in creating world-renowned medical, energy and space clusters that attracts capital and talent from around the world. Guayaquil has been a pioneer in Latin America in industrial and commercial development. Alone, each one has made a lot, but together, I am sure that only space will be the limit. I wish to all of you luck and fruitful discussion. And all the best from Washington. Thank you. Ok, creo que, creo que estamos listos para arrancar. De nuevo, muy bienvenidos. Silvia, gracias por, eso, por retirar el, la invitación. Um, bienvenidos todos. Um, el día de hoy para nosotros es uh, tremendamente importante tener un, un nuevo evento uh, que coordinamos con, con Robert. Robert Ayón es un gran amigo de la, de la Cámara y con quien hemos hecho ya varias de estas reuniones. Uh, quisiera dar la, 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 la bienvenida primero en español a, a nuestros invitados. Robert va a hacer el, la, la lectura oficial de sus CVs, uh, pero gracias Nelson Gim de, por acompañarnos. Nelson nos acompaña desde Guayaquil y, um, y es del un lado del puente. El otro lado del puente es, es Chris Olson desde la desde la ciudad de, de Houston, eh, y vamos a tener una conversación muy interesante. Uh, no quería robarle sino uh, dos minutos para hacer esta, esta pequeña introducción, dar la bienvenida, y luego arrancamos con, con el programa el día de hoy. Eh, para Amcham siempre es importante el, la presencia de ustedes, agradecemos mucho que, que estén con nosotros y siempre vamos a estar um, proveyendo lo que ustedes requieran para poder a hacer mejor las cosas y que el comercio entre nuestros países crezca. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being uh, today with us. Um, I want to welcome both uh, Nelson Gim and Chris Olson, uh, the two sides of the, of the bridge, uh, Guayaquil and, um, and uh, Houston as sister cities. But uh, what we're talking uh, about is how Uh, Ecuador can increase trade with the city of Houston. Um, we, I'm going to leave uh, Robert with the handling of the whole event with you all, but um, I really wanted to, to, to welcome you, welcome our audience, um, and uh, we'll make sure that this is only the first uh, event that we do today, but we'll do several others in the near future. Thank you for for your time, Chris. Uh, thank you for your time, Nelson. Uh, it's great meeting you all. And um, I'll, I'll let Robert uh, go ahead with the whole thing, as I said before. So uh, go ahead, Robert, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Felipe. We're very excited to have another session to discuss about the opportunities, about the impacts that uh, clusters have, can have in uh, the economic development of, of, of cities. Uh, as we have started this series of conferences, we started first uh, a few months back with the story of Querétaro in Mexico. Then we started, started seeing the case of Arizona. Then uh, a month ago, we saw the case of the space clusters around the United States. And now we're going to be talking about uh, Houston and the success story that it is about how it has handled uh, 
different types of industries and converted them into very, very powerful clusters that has allowed the, the economy of the city to thrive. And we have two very exciting uh, guests today. The first one is Nelson Gim, and Nelson, in this case, is the president of the Guayaquil's Downtown Civic Committee. He's an entrepreneur. He's also the ex-vice minister of trade and industrial production of Ecuador. And he was part of the regional delegation where Guayaquil and Houston signed the sister city program 34 years ago. So Nelson brings a lot of experience about how this relationship between the two cities has expanded. And now we want to see how and what are the opportunities for the whole country and how other cities can also in, in, that are that belong to Amcham, like Ambato, Cuenca, and Manabí, uh, can take advantage of these lessons, so they can also pursue either sister city program or may, or more bilateral conversations with other parts of the United States for their own benefit. And our other guest is Chris Olson, and Chris is the director from the mayor's office in charge of international trade. And we're really excited to have him here. He's a good friend of Guayaquil, and he's very excited about the opportunities for Ecuador. And, and now we're going to be having this extended conversation about what has happened in Houston and what are they doing now? How, how are they thriving? How are they adapting to the changes in technology? And what new uh, challenges are out there? And, and, and what can we learn in Ecuador? Because in Ecuador, we're talking right now about developing 20 different clusters based around different industries that are poised for exports. So this level of conversation is really important so we can leverage our resources correctly, we can correctly position our, our political capital, but where we can have the highest impact uh, for us to continue our path for growth. And with that, I would like to welcome Nelson Gin, and then we'll turn it over to Chris. Nelson, Nel you're welcome. We're excited that you're here, please. Feel free to share with us your thoughts about this event. Thank you. Bueno, primeramente un saludo a todos nuestros eh, participantes en este webinar. Paso al inglés, que es el idioma en el que está previsto que lo realicemos. Uh, Robert, una, nada más una pregunta. Estamos, eh, si se me ve y escucha bien. Muy bien, Nels. Perfecto. Uh, uh, greetings to the organizers of this webinar, which is uh, Clusters as Strategy for Development, Houston as a Successful Case, especially to Robert Ilon, Felipe Espinosa, and to the other speaker, Mr. Christopher Olson, uh, and to all the participants. Uh, Houston and Guayaquil are sister cities since 1987. Being Guayaquil the only city of South America on Houston's 18 sister cities network worldwide, thanks to the initiative of the majors and active citizens of both communities who recognize the important similarities and opportunities of collaboration with the concept of people to people diplomacy, trust and understanding through commercial, cultural, educational and humanitarian exchanges and interactions. I had the opportunity, as Robert mentioned, to be part of the delegation that flew to Houston in a Continental Airlines flight to formalize this relationship, which is now 34 years old. And it's a good time to reinvigorate it after this, the disastrous effects of the pandemic are subsiding and giving way in most countries to pre-pandemic normality and improvement of the world's economy. So, for Guayaquil, having in Houston a sister city is having a friend and an ally in the objective of thorough reactivation. And we hope Houston sees Guayaquil in the same way. My regards to the members of the Houston Guayaquil Sister City Association, whose initiatives and efforts are key to keeping the links alive. Guayaquil is a vibrant city, the most important port of Ecuador, with a very active business sector, ready to engage with customers, suppliers, investors, and partners worldwide. 
uh, we have a new president whose government is pro-business and as a general policy wants to have more of the world in Ecuador and more of Ecuador in the world, certainly in the USA. So we also have a favorable general political situation. We invite all participants to visit Guayaquil and all the other wonderful cities and regions our country has. Having said that, in regard to clustering, which let's remember is the coordinated effort to vertically and or horizontally integrate firms in related uh, areas or lines of business to concentrate them geographically. In my experience of member of the board of the Chamber of Commerce of Guayaquil, a private sector of the Aviation Board of Ecuador and as Vice Minister of Trade and of International Production, I am absolutely convinced that clusters are an excellent way of improving a city or region productivity and competitiveness. And Houston is a successful example that we in Guayaquil would like to follow. The World International Property Organization, WIPO, produces an annual list of the top 100 science and technology clusters, which includes cities as well as regions. And in its 2020 ranking, lists the Tokyo Yokohama region in the first place and Houston in an excellent 16th place worldwide. So when we talk about Houston as a successful cluster case, is not a subjective opinion, but an internationally recognized fact. Sadly, no Latin American city or region is in this top 100 ranking, but this gives us motivation to make Guayaquil part of this list of successful science and technology clusters. Clusters are not only a tool for economic development, but also, and very importantly, a way to create innovation, wealth, and to raise the quality of life of people that should always be present as a goal in any public project. Clusters are also an excellent way of public and private collaboration and synergy. As an example, in early 1997, the city of Houston, through its Office of Planning and Development, with a federal grant from the U.S. Economic Development Administration and the technical assistance of the University of Texas at Austin, achieved the redevelopment of a city-owned building into a centrally located business incubator, in base of which a leadership team was formed that included the Greater Houston Partnership and the Johnson Space Center at NASA. And talking about NASA and space exploration, I want to use this opportunity to congratulate Robert Eilon, president of the Guayaquil Space Society, for his focused and persevering efforts to have our city and country get actively involved in the space agenda. And we hope that we can develop concrete institutional and business links in this specific area with our sister city of Houston. I won't expand on this as we would have Christopher Olson, director of the Major's Office of Trade and International Affairs, get into detail about Houston's cluster. Like the information technology cluster that came of age in the 1990s and the ones that follow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nelson. Those are some kind words and Really excited to hear ab about your comments. Definitely there are some important lessons and Ecuador is looking to take the next steps toward its development as consolidated industries like the banana exports, cocoa, coffee, flowers, fishing, uh, shrimp exports, and now mining uh, are, are taking a, a very prevalent role in, in, the, in the economy. Uh, there's definitely room to think about how technology can definitely allow us to explore more opportunities and how we can leverage those resources and, 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 and that knowledge and uh, those new trade links so other parts of Ecuador can definitely develop and we can start thinking about other cities to pursue those paths and be able to be successful with that. 
and, and that's really, really important and, and, and how we definitely want to uh, see what can we learn here so we can definitely implement it uh, based on that experience. And with that, I want to turn it over to Chris Olson. Chris is a very dear, good friend, and we were very excited and honored that he's here with us. And hopefully next year, I presented a challenge that let's take a delegation from Ecuador to Houston and, and let's work to make that happen with all of your support from all the participants here. Chris, welcome and, and please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert and uh, and Nelson. Pleasure to uh, to meet you and thank you for your comments and the experience that you bring, not only from the the broad perspective throughout the country of Ecuador, but also your very very personal relationship and the re building it between Houston and Ecuador and specifically Guayaquil. We we definitely value that. And, and Robert, uh, again, it's it's fantastic to see you again. Um, as Nelson said, congratulations on everything you're doing with uh, the spaceport and, and building that industry. And, and again, my thank you to the American Chamber of Commerce in Ecuador, Felipe, and the entire team that's there helping, helping to, to tell the American story and build those ties between um, the United States and countries around the world um, that can create economic opportunity for all. And that's one of the critical pieces is how do you create that economic opportunity for everyone um, so we can do that in, a, in an equitable manner. Um, what I'd like to do for, for my portion of this before we open it up is, is kind of either introduce you to Houston for those who don't know the city um, or maybe reintroduce you all to Houston for those that might not have either been here for a while, heard of Houston for a while or, or think of Houston purely as an oil and gas town. Um, which it is, but it's certainly much more than that. Um, and then talk a little bit about how Houston is still evolving. And a lot of it has to do with the clusters that we have here in Houston that continue to balance our economic um, capacity and provide economic opportunity. Um, so from a history perspective, Houston was uh, founded in 1836. It was uh, a tiny little town in, in Texas and a couple of brothers from New York City saw Houston's opportunity as an import and export center that would connect the, the rich and largely agriculture center of the United States and really the center of Texas uh, to markets all around the world. And from these really humble beginnings, Houston has grown to be the fourth largest city in the United States. It's also the most diverse city in the United States where one in four of Houston's residents are foreign born and we have no ethnic minority or majority in the city. We have more than 140 different languages that are spoken in Houston. And we have the third largest counselor corps in the country with more than 90 countries having a diplomatic presence here in the city. So it began as this really small agriculture trading post in, in kind of the South on the Caribbean um, has evolved into a global capital of energy of life sciences, of manufacturing, logistics, aerospace, and aviation. And, and that's one of the things that, that we'll focus on a little bit is just this point of economic diversity. Houston is still regarded as the energy capital of the world. Um, about a third of the oil and gas jobs in the entire United States are actually here in Houston or based here out of Houston. Um, but Houston's also on that leading edge of the energy transition where it's no longer just oil and gas, it's about oil and gas companies cutting emissions, reducing the carbon footprint, but Houston companies also leading the way in wind and in solar, in hydrogen and in other renewables. And one thing that surprises a lot of people is the state of Texas is actually the largest producer of wind energy in the entire United States. It's not just the oil fields out in West Texas that are creating the most oil from anywhere in the United States, but it's also creating the most wind power from anywhere in the United States. Uh, but Houston's also home to the largest medical center in the world, where people from around the globe come for medical treatment and the Houston area hospitals and educational institutions are partnering with hospitals around the world to increase, increase the capacity for other countries to deliver healthcare. We're also a growing, or a growing center for life science and technical and medical innovation. And, and as most know, Houston's the Center for Manned Space Flight. And the first word ever spoken from any other celestial body 
than Earth was the word Houston when we landed on the moon. Uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center is, is the home of all the space flight and Houston recently became really the only urban commercial spaceport in the country. We're growing and developing an innovation sector and a digital hub where companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Verizon, and others have a growing presence. And of course, anchoring Houston, as was mentioned earlier, is the Port of Houston, which is the nation's largest port for foreign tonnage. And they're in the process of, of widening and deepening that channel to be able to increase our capacity to take imports and exports, both you know, cargo that is in the terms of oil and gas, which has been traditional, but also our containerized cargo. But, but one of the key elements is that Houston's not just kind of sitting on these existing industries, but we're really trying to move them all forward. The Financial Times recently noted that Houston is the number three center city of the future for foreign direct investment. And that's a, a ranking that's not just based on our, our business capacity, but also on our quality of life, our education, the affordability, and for just how far an invested dollar can go. Um, for the topic of the day though, being clusters, Houston does have a, a collection of sectors that have helped fuel our economic growth. Uh, we usually look when we're looking to talk about what sectors we're attracting and what sectors are important for Houston. We of course have our energy sector, um, but we're also looking to advance manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, and high technology. Um, of these, really a lot of them were built and created with a very, in very purposeful clusters to create a density of, of that economic opportunity that was based not necessarily on competition amongst them, but with the understanding that by having a number of industry of common companies in the same industry together, they could increase more talent or they could in entice more talent to come to the companies. They could create more opportunity and they together could build a sector. Um, I'll talk about really four of them. Three that are a little bit more historic and one that is, is what we are trying to do today. Um, and that's the energy sector, the space sector, healthcare, and what we have is a growing innovation sector. Um, within the energy sector, you know, Houston was a, an agriculture city, really founded a lot around the cotton trade um, coming out of Central Texas. But a lot of that changed in 1901 with the discovery of oil and spindle top. And with what was the largest gusher at the time, where oil was flying 150 feet into the air, um, something unseen and unheard of um, around the world when it came to energy, kind of anchored this region into what was to become the, revol the energy revolution with oil and gas. It was about halfway between Beaumont and Houston, uh, but Houston was successful in attracting at first uh, the company that became Texaco, um, and then on top of that, other companies that would become the Chevrons and would become the Exxons uh, to start setting up shop in Houston to drive the growth of the energy sector. So in a very purposeful way, a number of individuals sort of created the theme that Houston was the energy capital of the world. And with that, and with a few anchor tenants in the oil and gas industry, we were able to consolidate that market space and from here develop the technical and the professional capability of running what be has become and still is an incredible global enterprise in, in oil and gas. And that was built as maybe not a cluster as we think about it in the modern time, but really as a city that was gonna be anchored on an industry and an industry that would have a center point within the United States and that center point was Houston. Within the space sector, you know, when, when President Kennedy issued his, his requirement to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, um, and there was the, the scramble to see what we could do, there was a number of sites that were being looked at. Of course, <clears throat> what became the Kennedy Space Center in Florida was already a location that was popular with the military and was part of what was becoming a space program. Um, but what they wanted to do was find a center where they could have this new center for manned space flight. And they were looking at areas where you had a, a combination of some military infrastructure, a business and corporate infrastructure, an infrastructure that could facilitate large manufacturing if it was needed, access to the sea, 
And Houston just had all of those things. So again, once you have an anchor, a lot of things follow. So with the, what created the mission control and the manned space flight center became later known as the Johnson space center or the JSC. Um, you started to see a lot of that growing. The Ellington air force base grew to start testing pilots and pilots to start flying out of the Johnson space center continued to grow, to become not only the head of the Gemini and the Apollo space programs, but really into the shuttle programs. And of course, what became the space station and the space station is still managed out of the Johnson Space Center. With NASA anchored there, industry followed, both from a commercial standpoint and a government standpoint. So Ellington Airfield became a commercial airfield, now a spaceport. And with that spaceport has come the commercial space industry that has partnered not only with our commercial spaceport, but with NASA. Again, the theme there being a very conscious decision of utilizing what Houston had to create something around it. The healthcare sector in some ways is similar and in some ways is a little bit different, where uh, a very wealthy business person that grew up with the cotton industry again, um, at the turn of, of the 19th to 20th century, um, wanted to leave behind a legacy and left behind an extraordinary large sum of money to a foundation to do some kind of good. And the foundation owner said, well, well, we see Houston growing. We see the growth of the energy industry um, and created what is now the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. And MD Anderson, being that initial philanthropic individual's name, is now the name of the largest cancer research institute in the world and probably where the cure of cancer will come out of. Again, founded with an idea that we can create a sector, we can create an industry and uh, an entire kind of economic basis founded on the concept where we can bring a lot of these, a lot of these hospitals and a lot of these medical centers together into one place to be able to drive forward a commonality of interest within that industry. When we look at what the future of Houston is, when we were looking at the, the mid 1980s, about 70% of Houston's GDP was based on the energy industry and that energy really was oil and gas. We look at that today and Houston's only about 35% on the oil and gas industry. Um, and that's broadened even within the oil and gas to be the entirety of the petrochemical industry from plastics to refined products to everything in between that's based in that industry but that now is only 35 percent the rest of that is made up for with those other sectors with our medical industry with the high technology industry that's coming in with our with our commercial sectors with the spaceport and aviation um, the sectors of advanced manufacturing and logistics which don't really have uh, a hub but are certainly certainly a huge part but as we look to what the future of Houston looks like, we see this digital transformation, not only transforming within the energy sector, but really this high technology sector that is really driving a lot of economies. So Houston, using a sector thought process again, has created the Innovation Corridor. In, I guess it was about six or seven years ago, Amazon was looking to build Amazon 2.0. And it was the concept of Amazon having a second headquarters and cities from all over the United States began this rather fierce competition to host this next headquarters because most knew the economic value that it would bring. Houston with a lot of confidence, maybe arrogance, uh, said, well, well, we are one of the top cities to have this. I mean, just look at us. We've got more STEM jobs than anywhere else. We've got more STEM graduates than anywhere else. Of course, that's the science and technology and engineering. Um, we've got this huge healthcare sector. We've got this big energy sector. We might not win, but we're in the top five, no problem. So when Amazon came out with their kind of shortlisting of the top 20, Houston wasn't even on the list. And it really kind of created a lot of, a lot of soul searching amongst the political and economic leadership of, well, well, how did we not become one of the top cities? And it really created this, this need to examine what we have and what our future of our city is gonna look like. Realizing that what we thought we had is kind of the industry of, of the past, not necessarily leading us into the future. 
So the universities took on this challenge, the Greater Houston Partnership and all of our chambers of commerce took on this challenge. And the mayor really took on the challenge of how do we build a city of the future? That's not necessarily talking just smart cities. That's not talking a lot of the, the phrases, but it's how do we build that whole thing? And one of the ideas was creating an innovation sector where we could build an environment that is going to attract startups. It's going to re-attract high technology companies and it's going to attract the money that is needed to fund that. From that purpose, we've created a, a facility that's called the ION. It is a huge um, incubation facility for new companies that is part of the Rice Management Company, affiliated with Rice University, but also in partnership with the University of Texas, Texas A&M, the University of Houston, and all the academic institutions. Done in partnership with our major industry partners, being Microsoft, Verizon, Chevron, and many others. And part of what is an ecosystem of innovation that has already attracted a lot of these large accelerators from California and Silicon Valley, from Boston, from other parts of the United States to build this new cluster of innovation in Houston that we are hoping and looking forward to being that next generation of economic growth for Houston. And we're starting to see success from it. Uh, Hewlett Packard just relocated from California to Houston. Uh, Microsoft, Verizon, Amazon, and Google have all greatly expanded their footprints in Houston. We're starting to get more venture capital coming into Houston. We're getting more startups coming into Houston. And so it's an example of creating a cluster in some ways from nothing, um, but really taking the innovation that sat within the medical center, that sat within NASA, that sat within these large oil and gas companies, taking it outside of those companies into a new innovation sector district, and then building some capacity for them to have a home. And from that, you know, putting a lot of political will behind it, getting our economic partners in the city behind it, and then seeing how that can be driven forward. Is that going to work for everyone? Probably not. Um, but it's a model that even I was rather skeptical on, but certainly we put the entire force of the city of Houston behind it. And it's really starting to show um, some real success. So I think that as we, in the theme for the day being those clusters, the, all of them have sort of had an anchor and they've had not only an industry anchor that made sense for our environment, um, but also had a couple of anchor companies that were a key and critical part of how we got started. Be that, that the Texas oil company, Texaco for our oil and gas, be that MD Anderson and a couple of major hospitals that started and founded the Texas Medical Center, um, be that NASA deciding to put the home of manned spaceflight here in Houston um, that then generated the entire ecosystem around it, or, or building the ION and a couple of these other major incubation facilities that is going to be the anchor for our high tech sector here in Houston. So Robert, with that, I'll, I'll close kind of my, my formal comments. I open it to you for anything you might want to raise um, and then certainly bring in um, whatever questions people may have, both for, for Nelson and myself. But thank you again for the time. Uh, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for holding this event, Robert for, for moderating and hosting us as well, and Nelson for being able to join you for this. Thank you, Chris. That, that was some wonderful words from you trying to understand more about what's happening in Houston. And I definitely would like to start asking questions to both you and Nelson. So let me start with Nelson first. Nelson, when you first went to, to Houston 34 years ago to sign the Sister Cities program, how different do you view it now from all the things that Chris is saying? Is that the same city that you visited? Or, 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 or how, how, how surprised are, are you from listening to this right now? Well, uh, uh, Robert, I think uh, things have improved definitely uh, in Houston from uh, what uh, uh, Chris is describing us. And uh, it, I think precisely the concept of creating clusters and getting, uh, you know, different players together with the city has results. Oh, you muted yourself. 
you. Sorry? You, you muted yourself for a second. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, so what Chris was telling us, it, it, you know, shows how this combination of, you know, the public vision with the uh, participation of the academy, the business sector, and the citizens uh, do create value and innovation and uh, improvements on the city. And that, that is definitely uh, uh, a sign of what Houston is doing. Uh, just to mention an example, I've been to the MD Anderson uh, 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 Hospital years ago because it is a uh, very well-renowned uh, medical center for cancer treatment and many Ecuadorians go there. And I've seen this evolution. Now it's a Texas medical center, you know, which uh, unites several institutions uh, around the uh, medical uh, sector. And that creates value because, you know, uh, this combination uh, will make all the uh, participants try to improve on what they're doing and link with each other and eventually make the whole city in this area uh, more attractive. Uh, you know, so uh, definitely uh, uh, Houston is a good example of how over the years this concept has improved on the city uh, worldwide. Thank you, Nelson. And another question for Chris. Chris, as you were talking about, you know, the challenges that the city faced when they went through the Amazon bidding process and how surprised you were, how do you view the role of technology in shaping all these changes? And what's going to happen next? What do you foresee next for Houston? Well, you know, it, it, it's a great question. And, and I think that in a lot of respects, technology, even even over the last two years, we've seen a, a different definition of technology and technology adaptation. Um, and I will point to probably the easiest example of that by what we are doing right now, where doing something like this two years ago, it happened from time to time, but it was not something that, that happened frequently and that we did very often. Um, but now these kinds of virtual meetings, these kind of virtual conversations are just the normal way that people are conducting business. And it's certainly enabled us to globalize the way that we interact. Um, virtual meetings are never going to go away. They might evolve and change and we'll re redo a lot more of the personal interaction. Um, but technology is now, is now part of everything we do. And if you are not if you are not doing or bringing in the the high technology component into every aspect of the industry, it, it you will not continue to evolve and survive. Um, and I think in the next decade or so of economic development. And that's not saying that you need to only attract high technology companies to grow because a lot of those don't necessarily add value. Um, and that's one of the areas within the technology sector that I think Houston is, is taking a little different approach from some of our partner cities, um, not only Silicon Valley, but even just Austin, two hours away from Houston, is, is what type of industry within that technology sector you wanna be a part of. Um, and as we look at innovation, as we look at kind of not just iterative technology, but how do we really look to sort of change the way we do things, um, the way Houston's looking at it is Houston is going to be a technology hub for technology that also feeds into the industries that are in Houston. So that's technology that's going to feed into the aerospace industry or the energy sector or into our medical sector, building our life science industry. Um, but also some of the, I'd say the more maybe non-tangible with just software as a service technology that really you can develop anywhere but you need to have a certain gravity of that going on to be able to service it. So whereas I think parts of the country you're seeing a little bit of specialization in some of the high technology that's being developed there, um, I think of artificial intelligence, I think more of Austin now. If I think of a lot of commercial or um, kind of consumer type things, I think a little more of Silicon Valley. When I think of more industry technology advancement, I'm thinking more about Houston now. And so it's a lot of that evolution of technology of how it fits within the sectors that are already there, creating something whole cloth to sort of, 
as I've heard, you don't want to you don't want to try to replace Silicon Valley or replicate Silicon Valley. That's 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 a great solution. And as someone said, Houston, the new Silicon Valley. I, we like the Silicon Bayou, just because the Bayou City aspect. But I think you've got a you can take the great aspects from Silicon Valley and then create your own version of that to really put the stamp that's going to impact the city more than just trying to become another technology center. Sure, that's great, but how does that really fit within your overall economic development and help the entirety of a city move forward with all of the industries that are already incumbent there? Thank you, Chris. That, that's a, a very important response, at definitely understanding the role that each sector has to play and how you definitely can be a leader on that. And when we talk about technology, we talk about business, we talk about growth, but one important factor not to forget is about the people. And, and sometimes these processes can be very disruptive where people have to adapt to new technologies, new knowledge, new challenges, changes of career. Uh, and this is a question that I'm going to ask both of you. How do you foresee, uh, Nelson and, and Chris, uh, the best way to help uh, people to transition in these important stages? So as we move toward clusters that are highly technological, new economies that are being developed, uh, what are your thoughts about that? What can we do to help guide them through the process effectively? We can start with Nelson, and then we can start with Chris. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I think the pandemic has shown us that we have, uh, you know, enormous capabilities to adapt to uh, new situations and certainly to use technology to maintain our activities. Uh, you know, this is an example of uh, how we're using technology in, in a way that was not used before the pandemic, not at least in this, uh, you know, uh, levels. So I think uh, we need to kind of use this experience to start actively looking to get more involved into technology and into the use of technology for uh, everyday life and for uh, progress of our cities and regions and countries. So uh, I think that uh, we should make a cons uh, uh, an effort with uh, all the uh, society and uh, in this respect, uh, citizens need to be proactive in telling their local governments and uh, national governments to or get involved into this uh, as you know we that the ones that have served in the public sector know that citizens input is very important on the political agenda and as long as people uh, request demand propose suggest the public sector with enough uh, uh, with enough force uh, we they will listen and will try to accommodate these aspirations uh, of the citizens. So I think that's the way to go. And uh, we are in Guayaquil and in Ecuador are, are <coughs> here on that. And we'll uh, try to make that uh, effort with the new government that, that, that as I mentioned, seems to be pro-business and open to uh, listening to society. Uh, before uh, I pass to Chris, I would like to ask him to share with the audience how the uh, Amazon search finally concluded what city was uh, eventually the one that got the uh, the project. Thank you, Nelson. And, and Robert, you're absolutely right. That's probably one of the most critical questions facing, um, especially facing, you know, the elected leaders is how do you how do you pro help provide for um, economic transition and for for what we sometimes can consider a new economy. Um, as much as the, the pandemic highlighted our embracing of technology, it also highlighted a lot of respects the, the divide that exists between those that have access to the technology, have the education to be able to use the technology, and, and the availability of the technology to those that don't. Um, education was the most striking example when, when children were not able to go to school, and that digital divide um, really became apparent. I think the good part about it is it highlighted a major challenge um, and is forcing us to look at how we do that. There was already a lot of initiatives, um, but not nearly enough directed at, at reskilling, at attempting to and working to educate people for those jobs of the future. 
um, retrain people to adapt to jobs that maybe are, are disappearing because of the evolution of the economy and the evolution of industry. I, I would love to say we found the answer to that. I think like all urban environments, we have much further to go. And, and a lot of that starts from the educational standpoint, not only in the, the secondary education, but the post-secondary and in our trade schools and in the universities we have. Um, the way that we are training students for the jobs of not only tomorrow, but the jobs of today, frankly, um, is something that I know our leaders are examining. I know people are looking closely at and I think is really going to define those that succeed and those that don't. I think Houston's going the right way. I think we're positioning ourselves well to continue to grow and develop. Um, but that is the hardest part of, I think, the entire economic development and economic transition toward a more um, technology-based economy. Um, within the Amazon context, it was, it was kind of funny because that massive, giant, huge thing never really evolved the way people wanted it to. They, they picked New York and part of New York, but then New York didn't really want it anymore. And then they put another kind of 2.0 in, in Washington, D.C., or just outside in Crystal City in Virginia that is bringing a lot of people in. Um, but it never really quite evolved into the giant 2.0 that people thought it would. And what we joke, the, the beauty contest that the Amazon bid became um, kind of kind of never fully materialized in the, out, in the outcomes of it. And, and, and not only that, but Houston's seen a huge increase in the Amazon presence in Houston while still receiving all of the benefits of our learning from not getting the giant or not winning the giant contest. So in some ways it's become a win-win for us. Thank you, Chris. And, and we start thinking about how clusters work and the synergy that it needs to happen between the government, private industry and academia. How does it work in Houston? Who leads or is it something that is common agreement where everybody works together? Because sometimes we think that government has to, you know, top-down approach, be able to push it forward, uh, order things, and carry the right policy, and then the private sector follows. How, how does it work in Houston? Well, and, and, and I think you had a, I think I'm going to echo what you had said, actually. If we look both historically and currently, um, with the development of the energy sector, that was a pure commercial development, where oil was found, companies decided where they wanted to be, and they, they made it happen. Uh, with the medical cluster, it started with some philanthropic work, but then was a, an initiative both that was private and public because a lot of the hospitals there are the University of Texas Medical Center. It's a lot of, of partnerships that evolve there. And frankly, you have to have a concept of, of collaborative competition where in order to get 19 hospital systems that are all kind of competing for patients, Um, to be able to sit together in what really is a massive city in the eighth largest business district in the entire United States with more than 100,000 employees to work together is, is, is a challenge, but one I think that's unique in that environment. If we look at the space sector, of course, that was a government-led initiative um, and a top-down. This is where we're putting it, and industry kind of followed. But the, the newest one with our innovation sector, I think speaks to what Nelson was saying, is sometimes it takes maybe political vision and political will to want to make it happen, but needing to do so in collaboration with all of the other partners. Because we would not be able to build the innovation, system, or innovation sector we are if it weren't kind of a, the vision of Mayor Turner with the collaboration of the university systems that are here in partnership with private industry to create what is going to be the next big economic center for the city. That, that's wonderful, just, Chris. Just, Go ahead, Nelson. Uh, comment on, on, uh, on Chris, uh, uh, or just on Joe, what just Chris said in the sense that uh, th that is something the business sector is permanently proposing our local and national authorities. It's a combination between obviously uh, a, a political vision 
with the universities involved and the business sector mm -hmm. in, in, in you know, a collaboration together, because otherwise uh, projects tend not to you know, uh, get into results that are what initially was uh, the aspiration of those involved in the project. So that's why Houston uh, is an example we want to follow because uh, it has gotten the results that we see now. And, and I do think that that's probably the, the most important takeaway I've had. Now, I've only been here for three years in this position, so I'm still learning on a daily basis. But one of the things that is most encouraging about, about kind of the way that Houston's working on it is exactly that private-public partnership where, yes, there's always going to be the, the business government tension, um, but with what we see, a lot of the development is this partnership between all of the different organizations that are part of it. And whether it's, it's vision from, from government or vision from industry, um, getting buy-in from all of the stakeholders to be able to have a commonality of vision and a commonality of purpose. So that way you have the tools of government working in cooperation with the tools of business together with what is going to bring economic opportunity to the people seems to be where the success lies. And as we start thinking, Chris, about the economic development, I saw an important case with San Jacinto College and how that has been an important aspect in supporting new businesses to be attracted to come to Houston. Because mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's one of the main things that as companies are looking to relocate, they ask about the workforce development and training plans. How does that work and what role does a uh, municipality plays with that? Well, I think it, it, it shows a little bit the importance of the diversity of your education. Um, where where we can have, and, and Houston has been fortunate and San Jacinto has been one of those fantastic um, universe or schools that is helping on the reskilling, is helping on professional skills development to make sure the workforce that we have here can meet the needs of the current industry requirements. So we have the range of, you know, Rice University, which truly is a research institution, and then including the community college systems, including the, the workforce development institutions that are here, and a little bit of everything in between. And, and a lot of that came to corporate recognition of what was needed. Um, some of that came from incentives from a government. Uh, some of that came from just the, the educational imperative that was here or the recognition by the schools of they needed to meet a growing demand. But I do think it's another case of a certain understanding and partnership between the business community, the political community, and the education community of how do we make sure we have the tools and the workforce ready to move forward together. And not that the schools are just going to do what they want to do, business does what they want, and government is, is either directing too much or not a part of that conversation. When you've brought the three together, you can really have have some more results. Thank you, Chris. Nelson, a question for you. As your experience has to deal also a lot with aviation and you've seen so many changes in this case in the model of transportation, what aspects do you see for Ecuador in this case to, to benefit in, in this high level of transportation? What are your expectations that Ecuador can come, come closer to other communities through aviation in this, in your opinion? Well, well in, in uh, these years, there was this uh, disjunctive between like the country having its own airline and protecting it and the uh, consumer's interest in having more options and better prices and more destinies. So this this uh, situation has eventually uh, ended with uh, more of an open uh, skies uh, system in our country and in many countries in which operators are invited to participate in order for customers to be able to have more links to the world. 
So in the case of Ecuador, basically, uh, I think that is the uh, current view of most citizens to have the options that will allow us to fly, uh, you know, quicker at a better price to more destinies. And uh, the, the state uh, is not a good administrator. In Ecuador, the, uh, the, the government is, is about to sell what's left of the national company uh, because of this, because they, they, are, they, are, they are not able to operate as a private enterprise. And also when it's public, we, the citizens pay for the uh, losses the company has. And when it's private, was the, the, the business sector, the, 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 the uh, shareholders pay for, for, uh, for that uh, bill when they lose money. So uh, I think uh, you know we should get we should get uh, into the agenda of getting good operators to our country. I see the, you know the uh, the project of getting involved into space aviation very interesting because that would be a good opportunity to get involved into an agenda we're not right now uh, participating in an active way, and that's why I think uh, the efforts of White Hill Space Society and other institutions. Uh, are very important because this will generate uh, uh, eventually this kind of alliance that will give our country a new perspective. In this case, the, all the technology uh, involved, all the research involved in, in space aviation, and that is part of the uh, recipe that, that uh, Chris was telling us about because uh, in many of the countries, in Ecuador I have to say it's also the case, what has been happening is what, what Chris was saying, you know, universities, educational system go its own way. The, uh, the public sector has an agenda that's not uh, usually too well synchronized with uh, the business uh, and other sectors. And business also, you know, sometimes lacks a bit more vision to get involved into projects that by not me immediately profitable. But on the long term, with you know enough efforts on, on with other players, with other stakeholders, do have results, as we see in Houston. Thank you, Nelson. That that's great. And, and Chris, do you have any questions? Anything that you would like to know, or maybe ask Nelson or myself, as we're nearing the end of the event? So, so my only question for for you both would be, and Robert, I know your your engagement within the space sector, but but from within Ecuador's standpoint, both Quito, Guayaquil, and, and as a country, are there certain are there certain areas or sectors that you all think will have the best chance for success, or that you are looking to focus on growing over the next five to ten years? In, in my opinion, what I what I definitely foresee is how space technology in this case can definitely be an instrumental part of improving the competitiveness of the local industry. How we can use Earth observation to better monitor agriculture, protecting the environment, uh, uh, helping us uh, with illegal fishing, with mining. So that's a great place for us to start. Uh, where we can definitely have a big impact on local industries. To solve local problems that definitely require technology for them to be solved in a successful way. So that's a great place to start. As we move forward, uh, what research can be done, how that can be applied for new plant genetics, uh, eradicating diseases, uh, human health factors, that's, that plays a, a very important factor of, uh, of the learning curve and the opportunities as we develop. And then as we move forward with that, then we can start thinking about how do we create the ecosystem needed and, and the companies and attracting the talent. So education plays a, a key component part in, in how these all plays along. And educating policymakers, educators, and entrepreneurs is definitely something very, very important that is needed to have that vision about how space technology, you know, can definitely open new doors and how people can get involved. And, and I think transmitting that message is going to be the, the, the most fun and interesting challenge to have is how everybody can get involved with space technology in their local businesses, in the local areas, you know, and how they can all benefit from that. And, and, and I think that's a a great part of, of the challenge that we currently have about 
bring in, for example, uh, banana companies like ray ban Pack uh, to talk to Orbital Psychic, Psychic, which is a satellite company, uh, to talk about hyperspectral imaging. And, and, I, and I think that's great news to have those type of companies collaborating about developing pilots uh, for, for testing. And then we can start moving forward with other plans and activities. But there's a lot of room and a lot of interest to get involved. And Ecuador is a very diverse uh, ecosystem. So there are great lessons about how plant growth, animal growth, and uh, ecosystem uh, uh, maintenance can definitely be used as we start thinking about humanity's role beyond this planet. And, and that definitely is uh, very endearing in, in thinking about what we can contribute to this great exploration that the U.S. is leading uh, to with the space mission. Let, let, me, let me add to Robert's answer that uh, I think also very important is that we put space exploration in our agenda, in our minds, because when you when you have something in mind then you can start doing something about it and that's what uh, we're trying to do here with the Waikil Space Society and that will make us do efforts to go to that goal for example I, I was very pleased with that event we made uh, Robert uh, about students from Waikil, Houston and Scotland communicating with the International Space uh, Station you know uh, with the astronauts that made many students you know like start dreaming about getting into that activity uh, and that and that creates opportunities that creates aspirations and goals and i think that's also very important in a society because every city has their own day-to-day -day problems and we tend to concentrate on those immediate problems but we need to see further away and what better way to look that into space to uh, to for new opportunities so I hope we answer your question with that, Chris. <laughs> and, and with that, we're coming to, to, to a close and we're very grateful for all your participation. Grateful from Ancham, Kido to provide their house to us. And we hope that these great lessons can definitely be applied to all the CDC network. So they can start thinking about how they can get involved and what role they can play. And thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Chris, for, your, for, for coming to the, together today. We definitely hope to have a delegation from Ecuador visit Houston, and hopefully with the leadership of Felipe uh, Espinosa, the AMCHAM director, executive director, we can make that happen. So thank you again. Hope to see you soon. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.